welcome to the official Mountain View Church podcast. For information about our gathering times, location, or how you can connect with us, visit us at mbc.life. And so today we're going to talk about spirit-led ministry, and then next week talk about uh, the transforming union. You know, spirit-led ministry is, uh, he anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows, and surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life is that last thing where now we're, we're walking so closely with God at some point. I mean, we aspire to this, not that any of us ever really arrives, but as we hope, as we grow in our faith, we come to the point where we're walking so closely with God that he doesn't even need to lead us. He follows us. <laughs> Surely goodness and mercy and his goodness and mercy just follows from our life as we've become so one with him that we're blessing other people in his name just in our life. And we'll talk more about that next week. But this week in this spirit-led ministry, I I wanted to have a friend of mine share with you because um, Kevin Barry is a man that I've walked with for many years. And um, over the last you know, six months, we've been meeting together and praying together and just talking about what does the church look like and how can we, um, you know, build uh, into people's lives in a way that there's a legacy for years and years to come. And as we were talking this week about spirit-led ministry, I don't really know anybody that is more kind of just led by the spirit than Kevin Barry. And as I've watched him and as I've talked with him, he always shares such great wisdom with me. And we were talking this week And he shared something that he was thinking about with regard to this, because he's been leading a small group in the Journey of the Soul group. And I said, that's too good for you just to keep it to your small group. You've got to come and share with the church. So would you welcome my friend, uh, Kevin Berry? Morning, everybody. In the old days, we used to say, draw swords, everybody. But I guess now it's your cell phone, so. Anyway. You know, uh, I'm going to go off script a little bit here, because as we are worshiping, the Lord just dropped dropped something in my heart, and I want to be faithful to share it with you. And, you know, it says that he left the 90 and 9 to go after the one or to go after the few. And I just want you to know whether you're here or whether you're at home, what you can't do by yourself, we can do together. What you're struggling with in your own life, whoever that is, we can do it together. You might be in a desert place, you might be at the wall, You might be at a broken place, but God says, I bring streams in the desert. And I just want to make a call to you to come forward, to come here, to come be with us and let us gather around you and love you and uh, breathe for you and nourish you in the presence of God and to give you hope for a hope and a future. Amen. I want to talk about uh, Romans chapter 12, and uh, you can go ahead and put it up now, and you guys can just read it and muse on it uh, while I talk to you about the the backstory. Uh, As Todd mentioned, when David says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows, that's a beautiful picture of what God has done in his life and his reflections. But the question is, how does that happen? (laughs) Because I want that, you want that, we want that. And so I was thinking about Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and this may be a familiar verse to many of you. It was one of my old memory verses. And uh, when Paul wrote this, he was writing to the different churches in Jerusalem that were coming together, and he wrote this letter to them. And in the first uh, part of the letter, first two parts of the letter, he's talking about uh, God's saving power for his people. He's talking about baptism. 
in chapter 6 that were saved into the church through baptism. And in chapter 7, he talked about this conflict that he was going through inside of his heart that many of us struggle with. He said, I want to serve God with all my heart, but I find within me something working against me that wants to bring my mind captive, and it's a struggle. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this death, this body of death? And then you can just kind of hear Paul reflecting, and he goes, thanks be to God that Jesus Christ, our Lord, can save us and save me. And so then he goes into chapter 8, and he talks about that the flesh does no good. It's a broken system trying to keep the law that we can walk by his spirit in newness of life. And so then he goes from there, and he pivots completely around to chapters 9 through 11, talking to his fellow men, Israel, and he says, and you... God is reaching out for you, and God will never stop reaching out for you. Both Jews and Gentiles are now coming to Christ the Messiah, and God is calling you too into that one tree, Christ, who hung on the cross. And so after that, this is all these chapters, we're up to chapter 11 now, and then he turns to the church, which would be you and me, and he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, one, present your bodies, that we come as a family, as brethren, it's in the plural, that we come together here, and that's why I was making the appeal to people that are struggling out there. What you can't do alone, we can do together. Come together here with us and present your bodies. Because this little power pack is the container of our soul, our mind, our will, our our emotions, right? Body, soul, and spirit. We first present our bodies. For some of us, it's making the sign of the cross to begin to mentor and tutor our body and tell our soul, wake up. (laughs) And for others, it's lifting our hands in worship or clapping our hands in worship or bowing, you know, or smiling inside. But we come together and we present our bodies by the mercies of God, the compassion of God that's reaching out for you and reaching out for us. And we come presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We come and we say, Lord, I just yield. I just leave it at the door, whatever it is, I lay it down and I yield. And I say, God, not my will, but your will. Come in me, change me, deliver me, set me free. Cause me to live for you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And he says that that's our reasonable service or reasonable worship or our, that's part of our rational mind, that thing that it begins to convert that rational mind that St. Paul was talking about in Romans 7 where he says, I feel this other thing working in, in, within me that tries to take my mind captive. Well, how do we, what do we do about that? And this is what St. Paul says to do about that. He says, number one, show up, present your bodies. I can do that. We can do that. Number two, surrender. I can do that. We can do that. And number three, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, that's a great promise, and that's hopeful. That's exciting. So when we come to church, we get our mind renewed by the Word of God and by being with one another, that we may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. This struggle that St. Paul was in in Romans 7, where he says, I want to serve God with all my heart, but I feel this other thing trying to pull me down and bring my mind into captivity. Well, Paul's saying, come, present your bodies, yield to God, and let the transformation process take place through the renewing of your mind as you completely yield to God, which is your reasonable worship. 
So that's freedom for us. Integration is freedom. Coming together does something that can't happen any other place. You know, we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. And that's good. And the kingdom of God is here, and the kingdom of God is within, and the kingdom of God is within the world. But that's different than how God expresses himself in the church. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell everybody in the world. I wish it did. We wish it did. But in the church, Paul said that God put all things under the feet of Christ and made him head over the church, which is his body, you and me. And that Christ fills all in all by the Holy Spirit. The very presence of God, the incarnate presence of God is within you and me when we gather as a church. We come as individuals from home. We get up, we brush and floss, hopefully, and we comb our hair and we, go to, we get ready to present. But we come as individuals. But then we, when we come together into this building, we come together as his body, as the church. And something mystically happens, something divine happens, something glorious happens that can't help happen when we're just alone. And in the church, we have the worship, we have the word of God, we have the prayers, we have holy communion, we have confessions. We have the anointing of oil. We have fellowship. You know, we have all these things that God instituted in his church and makes available to us that we can be nourished, that what you're struggling with alone, we can accomplish together. And if you're weary, if you're worn out, come on, jump in the middle, get a seat in the middle, let us surround you and love you and help you through it as a body. Amen? So, I just want to share some of these thoughts about how God does that, because we need that right now. We really do. In the rest of the epistle, uh, in chapter 13 and 14 and 15 and 16, Paul talks about how we serve with our gifts. And he talks about how we serve one another, how we prefer one another, whether they eat meat, whether they don't eat meat, whether they drink, whether they don't drink. Just love one another and serve from a heart of love and unity. And he says, even the, civil, even the civil society serve and live to the glory of God. And you know, there's so many uh, demands on us right now. We have social media. And you know, years ago, Todd had me share with the youth, and it's like, <laughs> the message that God gave me, I still remember it. It was go vertical before you go horizontal. But as I'm trying to share the message, all these little rascals are doing this. And I'm like, you know, holy Jesus, hallelujah, you know. (laughs) I I go, they don't want to hear from some old man, go vertical before you go horizontal. What does that mean? You know? (laughs) Oh, glory to God. (laughs) But we have people out there that are, you know, uh, pogo stick Christians, you know, just hopping around on their own, you know, with their Bible, and God bless them, they're, they're saved, and they're doing good, but they're, they're wolf bait, you know, the enemy's got a shotgun ready to take them out, because they need to be in the body, don't step out of the body, don't step out of the protection, step in, present yourself, and step in, I need you, and you need me, and then we have others that are so distracted by the principality and power of the air that they're trying to fight this battle. I call that the bumper car battle. They're out there trying to play bumper cars with the Democrats and bumper cars with the Republicans. And, and you know, my son says, it's a wild, wild west out there, Dad. And he's right. But we want to influence them rather than influence us. We're under a theocracy. That's a Greek word, theos, that means God. We're under God's rule, under God's reign. 
We don't need to be red or blue. We need to just have, be full of the glory of God and full of the love of God and the peace of God, the Prince of Peace, and let that change our, 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 our families. Let that change our, our kids, our grandkids. Let that change our culture. Let that be a hallmark for the church. You can say amen somewhere. So we want our cross to go deep, all right? The steak, your little Mountain View steak, pound it deep. You wanna, if you want to go wide, go deep. We need the love of God. We need the love of our brothers, even if we disagree, or sisters, or persons. We need the love of our neighbor. We need to love our neighbor. And we need to love our enemies. Come on now. The thing that is going to be the hallmark of the church is going to make you or us look different than anybody else, Jesus said, as they know that you're my disciples because you have love one for another. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you'll be my disciples. And so we want to work toward that. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, when we think about how the kingdom of God works and how this works, uh, I'll just tell you by memory, you, you come together, you present your bodies, you receive renewing by the word of God. You receive transformation. And then the last thing is you prove out that experience in God. And the way it works is there's three governments basically in the earth, and I'm sure you, you know this, but let me just repeat it for good, good measure. There's a family. Your family is a government. That's a realm. And you protect it, and you're concerned about it, and you love it, and you should. The second is the church. The church is the government. We're under, uh, under, under God. We're a theocracy. And the third government is in our society. And what is intended was civil, civil authority for our protection, for our good. And less is better. But, uh, oh, hallelujah. So we want to pass it on, right? I'm not getting any younger and I'm not complaining, but I want to pour out everything I have, anything of value. My son Matthew's here today, and Lauren, Luke, and oh man, Brianna. And I, I want to just, oh, is that my Laura? Oh, hallelujah. My, my amen section. But I want to pour out, right? We want to pour out our lives. We want to take this baton, everything that's in it, right? The worship, the word, the holy sacraments, the prayers, the anointings, the fellowship, the vision, the earmarks of the church, the love of God. And we want to pass that baton and we want to run the race as the saints in heaven are cheering us on. We want to, we want to remove every weight that, that stumbles us and we want to run with endurance in the kingdom of God, on either side of the veil. They're cheering us on right now, the mighty cloud of witnesses, but we want to run the race. Amen? And David said, I would have lost heart if I didn't believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have just said, Lord, I don't see it. But let me tell you something. God is faithful, and if we take and we do the things in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And, and read it when you go home. Read it with your family. Uh, ponder it. And practice it. And as we begin to, to share wherever we can with our family and our children, our grandchildren, our children's children, we can pass the life of the church on that will empower them to live to the glory of God in whatever they do and to influence culture and not have it the other way around. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way they should go, and even when they're old, they won't depart from it. And I'm telling you, when you get my age, you, you start really hanging on to that scripture. And you go, did I do enough? Did I do enough? 
And uh, we really need to be sensitive about our children and our families, their education, what they're being taught, their worldview, and what is formed in them in our homes. We can, we can work in the church and, and we can do our very best to form you and to provide, informa- to, provide, to provide information and transformation for you. And that's what we desire to do. But I want you to play it forward in your, and this is an encouragement, it's not a, I want you to play it forward in your own life and in your family, whether you're telling stories at the dinner table, whether you're praying with them, uh, whatever you're doing, play the story forward so that when they have to go out in society and they have to go out in culture, they can live to the glory of God and they can influence their culture, not the other way around. And at the end of the uh, letter, uh, St. Paul said, funny guy, this Paul, he said, and the God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet. And then he goes, oh yeah, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Holy Spirit be with you. And it's like, what? You know, in Ephesians he said, God put all things under Christ's feet. And Christ is head of the church, which is his body where he fills all in all. And here, here at the end of this uh, book, he says, very soon, God, the God of all peace, will crush Satan under your feet. Interesting, huh? So we need that peace. It's not by strength, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so we need the peace of God, the rule and reign of God through us, that we can influence culture. And why? For the life of the world. For the life of the world. That's why we're here. That's why Israel is here is to to manifest the glory of God to all nations. And that's why we're here as Jews and Gentiles and all the family of God to live our lives for the life of the world. And when when we get a little paradigm shift and we think of it that way, it's much easier to love one another and love our neighbor and love our enemies. Amen? I love you guys. Thank you. So good. Thank you, Kevin, for doing that. Um, You know, I'm challenged by the idea of uh, of both presenting our bodies and being being here and giving ourselves in worship and renewing our minds. And part of why I've been using um, creeds and confessions and all, all these kind of anchors to kind of anchor us in our worship service is, is because of these conversations I've been having with Kevin and being reminded just how much we need anchors and things that we can pass on. And some of us in our, our desire to be new and improved and to always do exciting and new things, we sometimes leave behind some of the old things. And there's a lot of good old things that we need to keep in our life. And one of the ways that we are formed um, is, is through the, the things that we do in, in worship. We're formed in our thinking in our practice um, through that. I got to get one of these, uh, I I forgot my communion stuff. Um, And we're formed as we gather and as we do celebrate the Lord's Supper and as we recite these things and say this. So I'm going to invite you to come now and to take these. These are on your table. And, you know, ever since COVID, we've been using these little Jesus snack packs because they're, you know, safe. Um, We'll eventually get down to beer where we can really break bread and drink wine together. And, um, but in the meantime, you know, it's not the, the elements that's the important thing. But let me, let me read this to you, and then we'll receive this together in a second. I know some of you are already eaten, but that's all right. Just hold on. Um, this is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast that he's prepared. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's say uh, the words of the Apostles' Creed together as we affirm our faith in Jesus. I'll put it here on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, blessed forever, to you be praise and honor for giving yourself, shedding your blood, and letting your body be broken in death for our sake, so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Bless, O God, this bread which we together eat and this cup which we together drink. Let us through this blessed bread and blessed cup become partakers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together in the words Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So take and eat. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. And this cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ. Drink of it, all of you. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Give us now your peace and grant us strength and courage through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.